Greetings, eco nerdlings. In this podcast, we're going to be getting an introduction to climate, weather, and biomes. Let's get started. So the core case study in this unit is going to be that different climates support different types of life forms. But first, you need to know that climate is the long-term temperature and precipitation patterns. And this is what determines which plants and animals can live where on Earth. We have tropical areas. These are very close to the equator and they get intense sunlight. So this is where you see all of your rainforests and the largest amount of biodiversity. We have our polar regions, which include the two poles, our North Pole and our South Pole, and those receive very little sunlight. And then we have our temperate regions, which are those in between. These include the ones that are in between our tropical and our polar regions. So just what is the difference between weather and climate? We use these words interchangeably many, many times, but its purposes for this class, I want to make sure you know the difference between the two. So weather is the temperature, precipitation, wind speed, and cloud cover, and we give this in time increments of hours to days. The climate of an area, or the general climate of an area, is the area's general pattern of atmospheric conditions over decades and longer. So looking at this, we have our climate, this is just basically telling us, you know, usually in August it might be around, you know, 23 degrees Celsius or it might be around 32, 36 degrees Celsius if you live somewhere like Houston, Texas. Uh, weather, you might look and it might be 90 degrees or in our case, 110 degrees with the heat index. So what factors actually influence the climate? Well, we have incoming solar energy from the sun the Earth's rotation around the sun, as well as its revolution around its axis. We have global patterns of air and water movement, gases in the atmosphere, as well as the Earth's surface features. So right here we have climate, and this is the average weather patterns for an area over a long period of time, anywhere from a couple of decades, like 30 years, to over a million years. And the climate is determined by our average precipitation, as well as our average temperature. And these are influenced by latitude, altitude, ocean currents. And all of this affects where people live, how people live, and what they can grow to eat. So meaning what type of crops can they grow? What type of livestock or animals can they put on their land in those areas? So organization of the environment. The biosphere is the part of Earth that supports all of life. And scattered throughout the biosphere is a very wide range of habitats. We have deserts, we have oceans, we have rainforests, we have deciduous and coniferous forests, we have the taigas, we have all kinds of crazy things going on. We have super dark caves where we have animals that basically are blind because they've adapted to the dark. So there are all different types of life forms that are adapted to the environments that they live in. Each of these areas is called a biome, and it has its own unique geography as well as its own unique climate. So one of the ways that we give examples of climates is through a climatograph, which is basically showing the climate. A climatograph is a combination of the precipitation and the temperature graph for a given biome. The average monthly precipitation for the area is displayed as a bar graph, as you can see here. And the average monthly temperature is displayed as a line graph. So here we have our precipitation as our bar graph, and the temperature is displayed as a line graph. So what are the abiotic influences of an ecosystem? So if you remember way back when to baby biology, we learned the words biotic, which means living, and then we learned the word abiotic, which means non-living. So non-living factors contribute to the ecosystem's properties. So the two most significant abiotic factors that influence life of a biome are the temperature, again, and the precipitation. So looking at this, you can see that the higher the precipitation and the higher the temperature, we're gonna have more biodiversity. So we have our tropical rainforests receiving the most precipitation and having a very high temperature. As we go down in precipitation, we still have tropical seasonal forests, and then as we go lower and lower, we'll see savannas and then a subtropical desert. As we go lower in temperatures, you'll see polar regions, you'll see the tundra, the taiga, uh, those are receiving very little rain. As we go up, you'll start to see temperate rainforests. We have our temperate deciduous forests that are kind of in the middle as far as rainflow as well as our average temperature. 
So this is a generalized map of Earth's currents and climate zones. So we have polar zones, subarctic zones, cool temperate, we have highland. Um, the red is going to represent very warm ocean currents, while our blue is going to represent our cold ocean currents. Uh, we have major upwelling zones, which help contribute to all the different currents and the climate. Um, yellow is going to represent our dry zones, where you're going to find many of the deserts. And then we also have our red representing our warm temperatures. So looking at this, you can see it represents a lot of different information and data. So we're going to go a little bit deeper now. So one of the factors that we said influences our biomes and where, where animals and plant life can live is going to be the latitude. The latitude is the distance away from the equator, and it increases. Uh, the average temperature tends to decrease. So the further away we get from the equator, the lower the temperature tends to get. So if we think of the equator, those are all of our tropical rainforests, but if we go way up north, we're going to have lots of ice, lots of snow, and all of that. Same thing if we go way to the south, we're going to drop into our Antarctica, where it's going to be very, very cold. So right here we have latitude, which is a measurement in the degrees north or south of the equator. So right here is going to be our equator, and again, as we go towards the north pole, it's going to get cooler. And again, as we go towards the south pole, it's also going to get cooler. And then our other lines running from the north to the south pole are called our longitudinal lines. As the altitude or the elevation from sea level increases, the average temperature decreases. So again, as we get higher and higher up, if we climb a mountain, the temperature is going to drop as the higher we climb. So right here, we might have our tropical rainforest. As we increase in altitude, our temperate deciduous forests. Those are the forests that we have uh, when the leaves change colors and they fall off and you get all those beautiful reds and, and oranges and yellows. And then as we get into our taiga, these are our coniferous forests, the ones that are called evergreens. They have our pine cones, uh, they have the little brittle pine needles and stuff like that that allow the snow to fall off without breaking the branches. And as we increase in altitude even more, we get into our tundra, which can't support those larger trees. So you start seeing uh, shrubs and herbs, we see a lot of lichens and mosses, and then eventually we'll get into basically just icy snowy mountains. So in addition to changing altitude, the presence of mountains has a major influence on the distribution of precipitation. As warm moist air travels up a mountain range, the air cools due to the altitude, and the moisture then condenses. So as a result, the windward side, meaning the side of the mountain that the that the wind basically slams into facing the incoming air currents, it receives a disproportionately amount of precipitation more than the other side, which is called the leeward side. And this is called the rain shadow effect. So over here, if you see wind is going to carry precipitation, it'll hit this side more so than this side. Same thing as we get into a different type of area, we have our windward side having more precipitation, more moisture, so you're going to see more greenery on that side right here. And again, the opposite side, you're not going to have as much precipitation, so you're not going to have as much vegetation. Same here as we get into our dry areas, again, you're going to have our more vegetation on this side, less vegetation over here. So the Earth has very many different types of climates. And there's different factors that influence it as well. So we have air circulation in the lower atmosphere, and the air circulation is due to the unheat uneven heating of the Earth's surface by the sun, the rotation of Earth on its axis, and the properties of the air, the water, as well as the land. We also have ocean currents, and these are due to prevailing winds, Earth's rotation, the redistribution of heat from the sun, and the surface currents, as well as the deep current. So this is a diagram basically showing the global circulation of air. So if we start in the middle right here around the equator, we're going to have a lot of warm, moist air. So this warm air is going to rise, and it's either going to rise to the north or to the south down here. And as it rises, that air is going to condense and it's going to start to cool off. As it condenses and cools off, it's eventually going to release its moisture in the form of precipitation, and you're going to get rain. Over here, we're looking at solar energy and the intensity. So obviously, the equator is going to be getting the most direct sunlight, which is the highest intensity. That's why the equator is going to be so warm. 
And as the angle of the sun that hits the earth increases, we're going to get a decrease in the temperature. So right here, we also have energy transfer by convection in the atmosphere. So starting down here, we might have high pressure. Then we have moist surface air that's warmed by the sun. So over our oceans, anything like that, that has lots and lots of moisture. All of that air is going to flow towards the low pressure system, which picks up moisture and heat. It's going to get carried upward. We have the hot, wet air right here that's going to rise. And as it rises, it's going to expand. Eventually, it's going to start to condense. As it cools and it condenses, we're going to get precipitation. So the precipitation is going to fall down in the form of rain, snow, sleet, hail. And then some of that heat is going to be released into the space where it's going to be radiated. And now we have our dry air because we had all this precipitation coming out. Our cool dry air starts to sink. It falls and it compresses and then it's going to get warm. Then we have our warm dry air which again drops and it's going to pick up moisture as it goes through a body of water such as the ocean or over the body of water I should say. It's going to pick up that moisture and we're going to continue this cycle. So this is a diagram showing you the connected deep and shallow ocean currents. So we have our warm currents that are going to be in red and our cool currents that are going to be much deeper and they're going to be our cold currents. So the deeper the current, typically the colder it's going to be. The more close to the surface, the warmer the current's going to be. So we have something that you may have heard about, and it's called El Nino. And this is called a southern oscillation. El Nino happens every couple of years, and it's when prevailing winds in the tropical Pacific Ocean actually change direction. And this affects much of Earth's weather for about one to two years. And there's a link between air circulation, the ocean currents, and the biomes that all occur during El Nino. So this is a diagram comparing normal weather conditions to those of when we have an El Nino year. So normal, we have our wind patterns. We have Australia. The warm waters get pushed westward. Um, we have our thermocline right here, which is a little bit thicker. When we have El Nino conditions, we actually get a split. So right now, whenever we have an El Nino condition, you actually start seeing droughts in Australia and Southeast Asia. Those currents are getting disrupted. Um, now we have two different cycles of winds that are going on. So this is whenever you start to see a lot of storms and things like that, a little bit more abnormal conditions. So the impact of El Nino, which is the Southern Oscillation. So in areas that you see in this orange color, you're going to start getting droughts where there typically used to not be as many. Um, in the blue areas, you see unusually high rainfall. And then in the pink areas, you're going to see very unusually warm climates. So something else that also affects our temperatures and our climates are going to be greenhouse gases that warm the lower atmosphere. So these are some of our greenhouse gases. Most of the most common one that you guys typically hear about is carbon dioxide. And these are our natural greenhouse gases, and they create a natural greenhouse gas effect. The gases are what help to keep Earth habitable and human enhanced global warming. So we also have human contributions that are increasing the rate at which Earth is warming and we're contributing to global warming. So looking at here, this is a diagram that I showed you a little bit earlier. This is just showing how some of the radiation in the Earth is getting reflected back into space, um, how some of the radiation is getting absorbed. And this is also showing how sometimes in the greenhouse effect, not as much of that radiation or heat is going to be getting back out into space. We're going to be keeping more of that heat in the atmosphere than releasing it. Well, eco nerdlings, that's pretty much it for today. I hope you learned something, especially the difference between weather versus climate. This is the Queen Nerdlings uh, signing off, so stay tuned till next time. See you guys later.